Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to another uh, edition of uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. I'm uh, Attorney JJ Bicini, Managing Partner of the Bicini Law Office. And as you know, this is uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays is a project uh, celebrating our 20th year. Um, if you just have a management note for a second, if you want to receive a certificate of uh, attendance uh, for this event, kindly register at uh, dtt.ph so that you can be included in the list of registrants. And then we will send you a unique email where you can then uh, indicate uh, you know, the donation that you want to give because we're, we're charging a little bit for, um, for uh, an e-certificate, but we are giving all of that away as part of a uh, DTT donate. Uh, and the community has already uh, given out uh, to PGH and we're uh, sending our uh, donations uh, to uh, various um, COVID related uh, hospitals uh, or hospitals or frontliners in the, in the fight against COVID. Now, uh, our show today is about uh, the Internet Transactions Act. Uh, it's been 20 years since the e-commerce act uh, was enacted. And the e-commerce act was really the first law uh, that was enacted by Congress uh, to try to regulate the online, uh, online commerce space. Uh, the e-commerce act actually, when you think about it, was a very light, light touch law. What it did was, was to encourage uh, uh, investment in e-businesses by making it very, very clear that an electronic document uh, can be the same as a writing, meaning something in electronic form, on an email, for example, could be considered written, and that electronic signatures can be have the same legal effect as uh, as handwritten signatures, and most importantly, that electronic contracts or contracts that are uh, concluded electronically will have the same force and effect as uh, as uh, paper based or uh, paper based or other like verbal contracts, and so uh, that did a lot, I think, to 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 uh, contribute to the growth of the space. Uh, fast forward to maybe about uh, 10, 15 years. It took, it took a long time for, for the e-commerce space to really, really grow. And now it's in full bloom. And with the, with the pandemic, we know that uh, everyone right, is engaged in e-commerce right now. You're probably buying your groceries online. You're trying to minimize the amount of uh, interaction that you have with the outside world. Um, and perhaps it's timely you know, at this time, at this point in time, or at this point in history that our Congress is beginning to consider uh, to revisit, you know, it's been 20 years since the, the e-commerce app, to revisit how we should uh, look at and regulate uh, internet or e-commerce transactions. And, um, and, and, and they're doing that mainly through what's uh, known as the uh, Internet Transactions Act. Now, uh, uh, this is a law that is, uh, or this is a uh, bill, there are two bills in the House and in the Senate. In fact, the Senate uh, hearing just concluded uh, a few minutes ago, um, where this is being considered. They're, they're really looking at, Congress is really looking at uh, trying to regulate this space. And we have a, a, a good lineup of speakers to explain this, this uh, law and how it could uh, impact on your business and, uh, in your, and also what to expect, right, from, uh, from people wanting to do business electronically. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Attorney Oliver Reyes. He's also uh, a professor. By the way, he's the, our policy officer at the UP Law Center's Technology Law and Policy Program. He's, uh, he's also a, uh, a lecturer, a professorial lecturer at the UP College of Law uh, and at the De La Salle University and the Far Eastern University Institute of Law. He's a graduate of the UP College of Law uh, and he's the policy officer also of Digital Freedom Network. Uh, he was for a time uh, uh, with the Supreme Court and now uh, worked with the Supreme Court and for many years, was a senior program manager at the, Ameri at the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative, or ABAR Rally. And he's also the, uh, the co-founder of democracy.net. Uh, attorney Oli, um, um, so what, what Attorney Oli did was uh, he pre-recorded his, uh, his presentation and I will share that with you. Um, yeah, I'll share it with you now. Oh, why uh, is there no audio? Sorry, something wrong. Wait. Rule? No. Wait. I'd like to talk to you to this, this afternoon about some pending legislation that is now before the Philippine House and the Philippine Senate 
particularly House Bill Number 6122 and Senate Bill 1591. Both of them would commonly enact a law that would be known as the Internet Transactions Act. Now, the purpose of the Internet Transactions Act is to establish a unitary basic regulatory framework for e-commerce in the Philippines. There's no existing law that does this. Uh, there have been not even the e-commerce act or the existing e-commerce act which was designed primarily to establish a basis for legal recognition of electronic documents in the philippines rather than to regulate the particulars of e-commerce as especially they have emerged in the current day now um since there is no unitary law that attempts to regulate e-commerce itself uh, questions have arisen because multiple of existing regulatory agencies could possibly exercise jurisdiction over different or various aspects of e-commerce based on their existing mandate. So there is a perceived need that the regulatory structure that would govern e-commerce in the Philippines should be clarified. And that is one of the intentions of the Internet Transactions Bill. Now, another issue that has arisen is the entry of foreign players. Foreign entities who do not have a registered presence in the Philippines, but nonetheless are offering goods and services that are popular or widely patronized within the Philippines. Questions have arisen about the regulatory jurisdiction over such entities, as well as consumer protection issues. So that is also an issue that the bill seeks to address. So first, about jurisdiction over foreign providers of um, online goods or services. So one, one of the questions that has arisen was because they do not have a physical or a legal presence in the Philippines, meaning that they have not duly registered with our SEC or DTI or other regulatory agencies. Then the question has arisen whether or not they are because of their lack of a legal presence, able to avoid or evade regulatory jurisdiction of the Philippine government. And one of the things that the bill will clarify is that yes, the Philippine authorities may exercise regulatory jurisdiction. And one of the principles that informs the bill is the idea of holding such foreign players uh, liable as long as they are pur purposefully availing of the Philippine market. A purposeful availment standard, as lawyers may know, is one of the existing legal standards publishing jurisdiction, legal jurisdiction over non-residents. And that is the principle that informs this bill. So um, one thing that the bill would do is ensuring that as long as the provider is purposely availing of the Philippine market, meaning that they are uh, opening or making available their goods and services in the Philippines, even if they don't have a legal presence here. Um, and you know that there are some of these providers who even very intentionally uh, target the Philippine market through their advertisements, through the way that they market their products, etc. perhaps even designing a set of products that are specifically designed to attract Philippine consumers. Now, uh, in the Philippines and subject to applicable Philippine law, including the Internet Transactions Act. Now, another thing that the bill would do is to create presumptions as to who is authorized to engage in e-commerce in the Philippines. And the design has been that rather than requiring such entities to register again or to have a entirely different uh, registration process in order to do e-commerce in the Philippines, rather, as long as one is already registered to do business in the Philippines using or relying on existing Philippine law, then they are already presumed to be able to engage in e-commerce in the Philippines. So this would include Filipino individuals who are licensed with the DTI as single proprietors. This would include corporations, one-person corporations or partnerships 
that are duly registered with the SEC, cooperatives that are duly licensed with the Cooperative Development Authority, and foreign corporations that are duly licensed by the SEC to transact business in the Philippines. Now, um, as seen in the previous slide, even if one is, does, uh, such as, for example, a foreign corporation that is not duly licensed by the SEC to transact business in the Philippines, but as long as it is pur pur purposely availing of the Philippine market, that would be sufficient for Philippine authorities to exercise regulatory jurisdiction. And one of the regulatory steps that can be taken is to require that entity to um, follow whatever appropriate registration requirements may, as may already be required by Philippine law. Another key feature of the Internet Transactions Act, and this will be discussed in perhaps greater detail by Asek Pacheco, is the establishment of the e-commerce bureau. And the idea behind the e-commerce bureau is that it would become the focal authority for e-commerce in the Philippines. The e-commerce bureau would be under the Department of Trade and Industry, but it would be one of the bureaus under the DTI. But it is designed to be the central authority or the central focal point for e-commerce in the Philippines. And within that mandate, it would ca carry the authority to promulgate rules and regulations governing e-commerce activities. Now, the way that it works is that this exercise of authority or regulatory jurisdiction by the e-commerce bureau would be ancillary to that of existing regulatory authorities. The e-commerce bureau would step in if existing any existing regulatory authority does not act or defers the matter to the e-commerce bureau. Among the powers of the e-commerce bureau also is the granting of subpoena power so it can duly exercise its regulatory mandate. Enforcement. So uh, consumer complaints involving e-commerce would be treated as such under the Consumer Act. Uh, that is the design of the e-commerce act and when it comes to damages and penalties it would still be the regular trial courts uh, when I, or rather particularly criminal penalties uh, it would be within the jurisdiction of the trial courts this is with the, uh, but at the same time the DTI through the e-commerce bureau would have uh, certain administrative penalties as well as the administrative penalties that the DTI can already, can already exact under the Consumer Act. But one, one novelty, one new introduction in the e-commerce, in the Internet Transactions Act is the idea that online e-commerce platforms may be solidarily liable with the online merchants. Meaning that a online e-commerce platform may be liable to the consumer along with the online merchant who's, which, who uses the, those platforms in order to sell their goods. But this, would, this uh, solidary liability would only apply in any of the following circumstances. So first, the failure to exercise extraordinary diligence on the part of the platform to prevent any loss or damage to the consumer. The identity of the online merchant and platform is the same. The platform knows or should have known that the digital products sold do not comply with law or violate other laws such as intellectual property rights, and they fail to take the necessary measures. The failure of the platform to publish details about the online merchant. The failure to examine products that are of a special uh, sensitivity or interest to consumers, particularly food, drugs, and cosmetics. And these are products that otherwise relate to the life or health of consumers. And then there is if the online merchant is not duly registered with appropriate regulatory agencies and the platform permits online merchant to sell products. And the idea behind es uh, establishing solidary liability of platforms is to provide for effective remedies on the part of consumers because especially if the online merchant is located abroad or 
you have, you know, um, the, the details about the online merchant are vague and that the, which, which would preclude the consumer from being able to run directly after that merchant. If any of these particular circumstances exist, at least the consumer would have a remedy that can be exercised against the platforms themselves. Because the idea is that platforms would or should exercise a greater degree of responsibility um, than that which is already provided under Philippine law. So that concludes my brief presentation and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Attorney Oli. Just, uh, um, sorry. Um, thank you, Attorney Oli, for, for that presentation. Um, uh, our next speaker uh, will be Attorney Lars Sir. So let me just uh, bring up her uh, presentation. Uh, her, uh, here, here you go. Um, so she will uh, speak br uh, briefly about the, the other aspects of the, the, uh, the proposed law. Uh, she's senior associate at DCD Butet DC. She's a graduate of the UP College of Law in 2015. Uh, and is the head of the, the law firm's uh, fintech practice. She is a consultant on e-commerce uh, for uh, the um, for the technology law and public policy program at the UP College of Law. Uh, and uh, she is also has been identified by Legal 500 as a next generation partner uh, uh, in the firm. Um, and that is a Legal 500, of course, is a, uh, a lawyer's list um, that is published uh, globally. She, uh, she also heads the firm's legal uh, education initiatives for startups and regular, regularly assists clients in PSP license applications uh, uh, with the, for, for various types of fintech. So I'd like to uh, call on uh, Attorney Serso to make a presentation. There Hello, go. good afternoon. Hi. So just to make sure, uh, can you see my slide? It's not the presenter be read. Okay. Kita. Okay. Hindi siya presenter view. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Now, uh, for my talk, okay. For my talk, uh, I just want to give some context, although uh, Oli and Attorney JJ already mentioned some. But based on the explanatory notes in the bill pending in the Senate right now, the main policy goal of the ITA really is to uh, drive the internet economy in the Philippines uh, and serve as a catalyst for, as I said, the surge of the internet economy uh, driven by the growth, hopefully, of more digital platforms and e-commerce platforms. So it's mentioned there that compared to other ASEAN countries, and I think there are several studies that could attest to this, the size of the internet economy in the Philippines uh, is, is quite small. Uh, so it's still a very nascent e uh, economy. And there was one study, I think from 2018 or from last year, regarding unicorns in the ASEAN. And the Philippines, uh, not surprisingly, has not yet registered any unicorns. And out of eight unicorns, actually there was one from the Philippines. It was a real estate play. Uh, they received a valuation of $1 billion. $1 billion. However, out of the eight, seven of them were actually platform, uh, platform companies. And then six of them had some e-commerce aspect. So that reflects the state of uh, platforms in the Philippines. Now, uh, just to make the bill, the Internet Transactions Act, more understandable, I would want to walk you through uh, how it would affect digital platforms or online merchants. Like if this bill is enacted into law, will it make the lives of merchants or platforms easier? And will it make it easier for them to go through licensing and go through the compliance process? All right. So just to give you an idea, the scope of the law covers all types of digital platforms. So it covers, the, uh, it covers internet retail, uh, of consumer goods. It also covers online travel services such as Airbnb uh, and other websites where you can book hotels, flights, and vacation rental spaces. 
And then it also covers digital media providers, including advertising, gaming, even music subscription, and video on demand. Uh, and of course, uh, according to the bill, it would also cover ride hailing services for personal transport, for delivery of food, as well as for delivery of merchandise. And then lastly, it also seeks to cover financial services offered through online platforms. So this would include all types of payment services, including remittances, online lending, online investments, and online insurance. So uh, the scope of the law is really broad and basically seeks to, seeks, seeks to regulate all types of businesses with an internet, uh, with an internet component. Okay, so just to, just to clearly illustrate, uh, let's say that I have a, let's say that I have a startup. So I pivoted from a legal career, I moved into the startup world, and I started a career, career delivery service. And since I'm a startup, let's call it lawyer. So we don't like vowels, so it's, it's lawyer we do career delivery. So we start out with parcel delivery services and eventually eventually evolve into being able to do COD payments. Okay, aside from that, so let's say it becomes successful and then I expand the functionalities of my platform further and include a marketplace functionality where sellers or merchants can post goods that they want to sell and services they want to offer. And then in order to uh, streamline everything, I also form a, an entity that would do retail. So I would do retail directly, aside from be, being just a platform. I would sell my own products, uh, sell my own goods. So now, uh, as a startup, what regulations would I need to think about? Will there be a centralized registry for, for online merchants or for digital platforms? Will there be a unitary licensing regime that I can take advantage of? Will there be a centralized manual of regulations that I could just follow? So the answer, even with the ITA, the answer is no. So the ITA does not seek to replace any existing licensing, uh, licensing regime that's now in place under the different regulators. So you have the BSP, the DPI, the SEC, and all other government agencies. So those would still remain subsisting. And it would, licensing and regulation would still largely depend on the activities that a platform or a merchant would want to perform. Uh, and as uh, Oli mentioned in his talk, there's still no universal piece of legislation that would govern all digital platforms. So for example, if you're a career service, you would still need to get, uh, your riders would still need, need to get some type of permit from the DICT. Payments would still be under BSP, uh, et cetera. Okay, so what's the effect of the ITA on my business as a startup or on startups everywhere in the Philippines? Uh, as mentioned, the bill, once it becomes law, would clearly indicate qualifications before an entity may engage in e-commerce in the Philippines. Uh, so as mentioned, an entity must be licensed in the Philippines either as a, a sole proprietor, as a corporation, as a partnership cooperative. And if you're a foreigner, you must be licensed to do business in the Philippines. Now, uh, I would like to clarify that this, uh, this actually already exists in current regulations if you read the Foreign Investments Act, as well as other regulations on doing business in the Philippines. I think what the law does is that it removes any doubt uh, and any question as to whether a foreign entity without any presence in the Philippines, but targets Philippine consumers, whether these entities would have to uh, license themselves and uh, be under the jurisdiction of uh, Philippine regulators. So with this law in place, where it clearly states that to engage in e-commerce, you have to be licensed here. Uh, clearly, even foreign companies without any presence here would need to get a license to be able to uh, engage business here. And then the bill also includes a provision that seeks to contribute to uh, the main thrust of government to push for more ease of doing business in the Philippines. So it, the law mandates LGUs and other entities to provide some type of online registration of businesses, particularly those engaged in e-commerce. So this is in line with uh, the ARTA. Now, I think mainly the main, the main contribution of the law would be on how it enhances consumer protection in the Philippines. So 
<clears throat> aside from, I think it builds on the existing uh, rules and regulations for consumer protection under the uh, Consumer Protection Act as well as the e-commerce law. Uh, now, there are several provisions that provides for best practices for both the platform and online merchants. So there's a pretty long provision uh, on code of conduct or minimum uh, minimum provisions that all entities engaged in e-commerce must comply with. So this would include uh, undertakings and covenants from the participants that they would comply with. For example, intellectual property rights. They should ensure that goods and services marketed and sold to Philippine consumers on their platforms uh, are compliant with Philippine regulatory standards, uh, including those for like health or food products, and must provide accurate information in both Filipino and English. And then there's an ex explicit requirement saying that um, the merchants and the platforms must be transparent as to costs to avoid any hidden charges. So this would include like deliveries or cancellation fees. It should all be written down. Uh, there should always be cancellation options for the consumer and uh, a way for them to track deliveries. And again, there's an active, an active uh, requirement for platforms and merchants to take consumer complaints seriously and actually provide education to consumers about the risks of transacting online. And then there are also provisions on commercial communications, wherein platforms must clearly identify a message as having, uh, as being a commercial communication and identify whether something is a promotion uh, or, or something is a promotion. And if they do offer promotions and discounts, premiums, etc., then the mechanics of those activities uh, or the terms and conditions of those promotions should be clearly specified. And then, uh, I think one of the biggest ways that this law could impact platforms is the requirements that it sets out for platforms before they can on onboard merchants onto their platforms. So the law requires platforms, for example, to collect and display on the website the registration documents of all merchants uh, participating, as well as the address and contact information of those merchants. So that will for sure uh, add some operation, operational costs on the side of the uh, platform. And then one interesting provision is that uh, an online platform must come up with a registry or a list of all its participating merchants and submit that list to the Bureau. Uh, the intention being really, I mean, if you look at all, all these provisions, the intention is to try and build leg, uh, legitimacy and trust in how platforms and merchants go about their online transactions and hopefully uh, give better protection to consumers and the public in general. Okay. Uh, aside from protecting the consumers, the law also provides some protection for online merchants themselves as well as a chance to be more quote-unquote legitimate. So, <clears throat> There's a provision there on how online merchants can uh, can seek remedy against against other people in the supply chain in the event that the consumer files a complaint against, let's say, uh, a product sold by the merchant. So, as lawyers would know, merchants actually can already, uh, in a way, go, in a way, file a claim, uh, file a claim against their supplier or the entity from whom they bought the goods. But again, this law just uh, puts that into writing and makes it clearer. So it says that if a consumer files a complaint and then it's the investigation would show that the defect in the good is the fault, not of the merchant, but of the supplier, then uh, the merchant can, uh, in a way, minimize its liability. And another interesting thing is the e-commerce trust mark the Bureau under the DTI would come up with a mechanism wherein they would issue trust marks that websites or platforms, including merchants, could use and display in their own marketplaces. And then that would prove that that particular merchant uh, is compliant or, or demonstrates efforts to comply with the code of conduct provided under the law. 
Okay. So that's basically the effect of the uh, ITA. And then, so where do we stand now? So clearly, the ITA uh, is more of a consumer protection uh, piece of legislation. It does not affect any existing licensing regime uh, for different types of online platforms. And then the regulation at the end of the day would still depend on the activities conducted by each particular uh, entity, whether you be a platform or a merchant. So as mentioned, uh, this is just a run through of all uh, the possible regulations that a platform or a merchant would might be subject to. So for courier services, you have the DICT, that's the uh, regulator for all parcel delivery services. So what's regulated here actually are uh, the riders and the people doing the deliveries. They need to get a permit. And then if you're a ride sharing application, let's say you're Grab, you're uh, a driver, or you're the owner of the network operating that system, you need to get a license and authority from the LTFRB under the DOTR. Uh, and then if you're a three-wheeled vehicle, uh, like your tricycle, you'll, be, you'll fall under the LGU. The reason I included that here uh, is because there was a time, maybe several months, where I think until now, where there's some sort of regulatory confusion as to where motorcycle taxis would fall under. Uh, there's, there's, there was this one, uh, so, so let, let's say you're a motorcycle taxi back in 2017, and then you wanted to get a license. Uh, the most obvious thing for you to do is to go to the LTFRB and get the license to be a TNBS. Uh, however, if you go to the LTFRB back then, they would tell you that they can only regulate four-wheeled vehicles. You need to go to the LGU. Then when you go to the LGU, they'll tell you that they can only regulate three-wheeled vehicles. So parang, uh, that's a, I guess, typical experience of an entity uh, in an area that still, that does not fall under your traditional boxes for regulation. And then, ayan. And then if, you're, if your courier service has some sort of uh, payment service, like let's say you do COD, you may also fall under the regulatory jurisdiction of the BSP. So yon. anytime your activity or whatever type of business you are would include some sort of payment service or movement of funds, uh, most likely you'd, be, you'd fall under the BSP and you will need to get some sort of license or registration. So for example, if you do payments, you need to get or you need to register as an operator of payment system. So that's just an online registration with the BSP. Uh, and even if you're just a tech provider, let's say you just provide information, you're not really the entity handling the money, you'll still be an OPS for the BSP. And then if you do more complicated uh, money service business, then you can either be, uh, you, can, you may either be required to get a remittance license or Forex, e-money, et cetera. And then of course, if you develop a closed loop system for payments, let's say gift cards uh, on, your, on an app or on a, through the use of cards, then you may also fall under the jurisdiction of the DTI if that's a gift check. Okay, now for consumer protection, just to clarify, the ITA uh, did not or does not seek to replace all existing consumer protection regulations. It just adds another layer of uh, protection. These pieces of legislation would continue to exist and would be applicable depending on the type of transaction that's involved. So generally, the Consumer Act of the Philippines, the E-Commerce Act, and the Cyber Crime Prevention Act uh, would apply if the transaction involves digital transactions. And then for data protection, if you process data, if you process personal information, then the Data Privacy Act would apply. There are more special laws if you're handling more sensitive types of data. Let's say if it's health, then very special laws would apply. Uh, if you're handling payment data or financial data, and you're under the jurisdiction of the BSP, you may need to apply. You may need to comply with the BSP security standards, as well as consumer protection standards. Okay, so. Uh, so that's where we are. Now back to my previous example, as I said, like I have a startup. Uh, what if, so my business, 
uh, I, I managed to grow the business. I managed to get a lot of users, get a lot of traction. And then the next step na is fundraising. I want to expand my operations, upgrade my current system. So I'm looking at getting foreign investors. Okay, so lawyer, the startup, is a wholly owned Filipino entity. But now I'm looking at uh, foreign investors. Will I be able to, will I be able to uh, issue them equity or get funds from them? Okay. So in summary, uh, any, the answer would be it, that may be problematic. Uh, I may need to maintain my status as a wholly owned Filipino entity because of the existing regulations on mass media and retail. <clears throat> so under our existing regulations, all platforms or any entity that uh, does or that, that communicates ideas to the public, whether it be through, pub, uh, through newspapers, radio, or the internet, may be deemed as a mass media entity. So the definition is very broad. And the SEC has issued repeated opinions stating that digital businesses that display information pertaining to third parties, like third party products, third party goods, are in fact mass media. Although recently, last year, the SEC provided a clarification or provided certain guidelines which a platform should comply with in order to avoid being deemed as mass media. So they said if you're just listing the available services on your platform, so let's say you're just listing the goods that people can buy on your platforms, you're not actively marketing them, uh, you're not displaying promotional materials, then you're not mass media. So this particular standard may be problematic and may be difficult for digital platforms to follow since follow, if, if you follow this, it, it would be difficult for you to come up with a user interface that would grab the attention of your intended market. And then it would also be problematic in terms of uh, earning or maximizing revenue since it would prevent you from publishing ads uh, and hosting paid content. <clears throat> so that's mass media. That's one thing we need to deal with. But another issue would be retail. As I said, I would be conducting retail on the platform as a direct retailer. And if you look at the law, retail is liberalized, meaning foreigners can participate. A retail entity can be 100% foreign owned, how, uh, subject to certain requirements. So I've listed here the three main requirements for foreigners to participate. It all has to do with number one, uh, capitalization requirement, which is 2.5M. A uh, history of retailing, so a five-year track record in retailing. And the foreigner must have five retailing branches, like physical branches. And then the foreign retailers' home jurisdictions uh, allow the entry of Filipino retailers. Now, if you go through that list, uh, it's impossible for digital retailers to, to tick all of those boxes because of the requirement for the five-year track record for retailing and the requirement for fiscal branches. Now, digital re retailers would have no way of complying with that. So conclusion is I need to, I can't raise uh, from foreign investors. Now, uh, that's where we are. Just to, before I end, before my last slide, I just want to show you this. This is a survey conducted by Kubo uh, Philippines. Uh, PwC map and idea space involving founders and investors in the Philippines. So, uh, as I mentioned at the start of this, at the start of the presentation, the main goal of the law really is to drive the internet economy in the Philippines and encourage more digital platforms. Uh, in this survey, founders were asked what the challenges they faced were uh, when they were starting their business. And obviously, the number one would be capital requirements, so funding. But the second, the second issue was regulatory requirements. So <clears throat> those are still, those, those two are still the main uh, hurdles that founders are trying, to, are trying to solve. And it's not really access to uh, the relevant networks or market readiness. 
uh, the main concern is still yeah, regulatory regulatory requirements. And then same thing, investors naman, they were asked what uh, what they thought were preventing startups from being disruptive. So similar then siya. Number one is fin financial resources. Number two, uh, the regulatory factors that startups have to deal with in the Philippines. So yun. So to conclude, uh, what's our takeaway? So the ITA, the bill, once it's enacted into law, it's just one factor that e-commerce platforms and merchants need to consider when doing business in the Philippines. And the good thing is, the positive is that uh, it enhances, def definitely enhances protection for consumers. And by, by instituting minimum codes of conduct, etc. And hopefully it contributes to the ease of doing business for merchants because of that online registration thing. Uh, however, we also need to look at how it would impact the desirability of the Philippines as a hub for regional uh, e-commerce platforms and other uh, other types of platforms. So there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lars. Uh, just okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Um, so you know, I. I've, I uh, I joined. Uh, I guess I started doing uh, policy work uh, in this area. I guess about twenty years ago, when I when I was tapped to write the the e-commerce act, implementing rules and regulations. And since then, I've dealt with a lot of uh, government officials. And uh, you know, when when you're outside and and you don't really see how government works, you have these preconceived notions of of you know the inefficiency of government these are the sort of things that people like to complain about uh but when you f finally see people uh up close you find uh no you find that there are actually a lot of people in government who are uh thoughtful individuals with a lot of uh passion for for serving and making a difference and wanting to use government as the vehicle to make lives better in the country and one such person is uh uh, our next speaker, who's the Assistant Secretary for DTI, uh, Mary Jean Pacheco. Uh, we met her uh, a few years ago. We were working on a few things. She's very enthusiastic about uh, the projects that she's involved in, and she wants to make a difference. And most importantly, and I think this is uh, very telling, she's, she's a very hard worker. Uh, I think there was a time where she asked me to show up for some uh, radio show. It was very early in the morning. And she was there, I believe it was a Saturday, uh, you know, if, if, if we can, uh, if, and I'm sure a lot of government officials are, are also like that, but I think the, the kind of passion that I see in, uh, in uh, ASEC Gene is, is something that uh, is quite extraordinary. Uh, so she, she graduated uh, with a Master's in Public Policy from Massey University in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, started her, uh, based on what I see here, started her public service uh, working with uh, the Office of Senator uh, Lauren Legarda. Uh, moving up to uh, the Senate Committee on Agriculture. Um, and then she joined the, the DPI as Director for her plan, Corporate Planning Services, rising to Division Chief of SITEM Corporate Planning Division, and is now the Assistant Secretary for the Department of Trade and Industry, and working hard now to, to really improve uh, um, e-commerce as a space, uh, try to uh, do the things that, that, that uh, they believe are, are necessary. I think that government is necessary to to see a vibrant, uh, vibrant um, uh, e-commerce ecosystem uh, in the Philippines, um, I, I'm pleased to uh, welcome uh, ASEC uh, Jean Pacheco. Wow! Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Wow! Ang ganda naman sir ng iyong ano. Uh, I was oh, I promise I won't take an hour. Um, only twenty minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will be. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, thank you, thank you, Attorney Dicini. Uh, I, 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 I. Did you tell them where we just came from? Uh, we came from a of a public hearing of the Internet Transactions Act. Um, and uh, I know you left a few minutes ahead of us, and uh, it was already agreed that the Senate Committee will will um, will um, uh, come up with a technical working group. So I, I think that uh, we would expect some 
invitation from from the Senate committee. Also, um, it would be good to also mention here uh, some breaking news. Um, I just sent you a few minutes ago a copy of the committee report that has already been filed by the House um, the House committee. So um, they're moving faster. Um, uh, we expect that once the committee report is out, that means that uh, we should be ready for to assist in the plenary where this will be um, debated on. So um, I believe that uh, my assignment for today is really to talk about the Internet Transactions Act, but also to focus on the DTI e-commerce office, of which I am the e-commerce lead. Um, so I'll make it in a two-part mini-series, but I'll make it brief because I'd like to, uh, it's a, um, I'm sorry, I just missed um, Attorney Oliver, but uh, I, I, it is, it's, it's great um, to, to listen to the previous um, speakers who have put a little bit of some background on the law. So most of the virtual audience here would already understand what the Internet Transaction, the proposed bill or the proposed Internet Transactions Act um, actually looks like. Um, I, I just have to always remind, and we're, we're very, very happy, uh, when the president uh, mentioned this in the State of the Nation address, that, spe that spells a lot. Uh, when the president um, um, states it uh, as a matter of, of, of uh, policy, um, we believe that the, it should be a little faster, and uh, hopefully this will be cer certified by the president. Um, so I think this is also the very reason why the bo both houses of Congress are are actually moving forward in the deliberations in the Senate. So it's very clear uh, that the president really wanted to um, to, to um, speed up the enactment of this law because of both of two reasons, no? which is to promote the growth of e-commerce at the same time um, protect also the consumers because there's a lot. Um, okay, um, my, my slide's not moving. Okay. So the parliamentary status, um, as I've mentioned, we a few minutes ago we just came out from a uh, Senate committee. Uh, now that uh, so this should change, uh, we now have the second public hearing, and now I also mentioned that um, the committee report has been uh, been released. Now um, I'd like to thank uh, Attorney Desini and of course Attorney Oliver who's been helping us. And uh, actually two years, a little bit of a background, um, two years. No, yeah, a year ago, the Secretary of Trade appointed me, designated me to be the e-commerce lead. So we created this uh, group, um, and this is where we consolidated or engaged the private sectors. And that was the very first um, act, the first act that I did was really to put all of the the ecosystem together. We have a Philippine e-commerce roadmap in 2016, and that should end in 2020. So the immediate um, item for the day was really to come up with a form, the new e-commerce Philippines roadmap. And uh, the very first thing, and I have to tell this to everyone, Attorney JJ, that when I was first appointed, the very first person that I spoke with was um, was uh, Attorney JJ and Janet Tora. So I had to look for, ano bang dapat pong gawin? So, so everything that they um, discussed with me, I put it all in my head and and executed and they said why don't you make sure that the 53 actionable items in the e-commerce roadmap we should be doing and that's exactly what we're doing now and uh, imagine covid lang but um but we are all but we are um, nonetheless following up all of the action items in the roadmap so we are mo moving forward what we want what we have been doing for the past year is to collaborate with uh, other uh, government agencies and as well as the the private sector. Uh, we are following a very simple framework, which is an SSS framework is equals to sales, which is structure, speed, and security, which is equivalent to sales. After all, this is why we want, why you're promoting e-commerce. At the end of the day, we want to have more sales for them. And uh, when the secretary again uh, met when we did the kickoff, one his I call it the prime directive. He said, build trust between online sellers and online consumers. Okay. Now some context, COVID, and this is a barometer that we use in the Department of Trade. Um, I'd like to I'd like to um, report to everyone that business name registration division. The uh, business name registration is part of my portfolio as as um, e-commerce uh, as assistant secretary, no? Um, and we can see prior to COVID, uh, we have been mindful of this. Um, P six four seven nine one three. Now this would be businesses that are that have identified retail sale via the internet. So this um this P six. So from let's say thousand seven hundred fifty three this year uh, before COVID, 
uh, I'm sorry, that should be pre, no? That should be pre-COVID, sorry. And during the COVID period, 43 times higher, no? From 1,700 in January to March, it has gone up to 78 business names registered. So imagine uh, it really picked up that there are a lot of, of online sellers out there. Of course, um, as business, of course, this is the sign of, you know, business. We look at it as a barometer of, uh, online, of more people going into online business. But as the, uh, but as the business names uh, increase, we also have another barometer, which is the consumer protection. Uh, the DTI, uh, as you can see from the mandate of Trabajo, Negocio, and Consumer, um, we, are, we have registered more than, uh, we have received uh, more than 13,000 complaints relative to internet transactions. Now, so these are, only transac these are only complaints relative to online transactions. Um, if you look at uh, offline, I think the total year would be about 45,000. But so this is only 13,000. But considering what we had a year ago of 2,000, and dami na, no? we can very well see that there are a lot of complaints received by the Department of Trade. So all of you out there, I'm sure at one point in time you've been victimized. All you need to do is to call uh, the Department of Trade, consumercare.tti.gov.ph. Now let's go to the bill or the proposed Internet Transactions Act. And uh, I, 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 again, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank uh, Attorney JJ and Attorney Oliver, without whom of the UP Law Center, you know, we've been, we've been uh, it's been a blessing with them that we've been getting uh, help, uh, legal expertise on the proposed uh, internet transaction. So there are three basic principles. Uh, it, we, we are really supporting this. Why? Because it promotes Filipino platforms and businesses. Uh, it promotes the interests of consumers. And of course, it balances uh, the private sector and then the government. Um, why? Uh, let's first go to the promoting the, and supporting the Filipino platform. The proposed bill embodies the principle that offshore non-resident platforms shall be treated under the law equally as domestic platforms. No? And this equal treatment gives domestic platforms the opportunities to grow and be competitive. No? So that's one of the things that, that really we are promoting. Uh, and that's why we are supportive of this particular bill. Now, there is a version in the Senate that is now, but we don't see in the House. No? Um, uh, it's, a, it's a version on the tax incentives uh, for, for newly registered online enterprises. Of course, yan ang ano namin sa Department of Trade. But I, of course, I would, uh, you know, having come from another engagement here with the DOF, of course, that's something uh, that, you know, we need to tackle with the DOF. But the DTI supports the creation of businesses. So we are saying we support that version in the Senate bill which encourages domestic entrepreneurs. Now, so when they, when they um, register for their online businesses, they should not medyo, um, get, be afraid of the taxes, no? whether um, national or local taxes. So exempted muna sila. So that's, um, that's a provision that uh, you know, the, the bill promotes online merchants as it promotes online uh, consumers. No? So this is one, one provision that we hope to be carried out by, by, by the Senate. Now, um, the, the third, the, it promotes some um, Filipino um, uh, platforms and businesses because um, it gives us a regulatory framework. And uh, I have to tell you this because very, very recently we had, uh, we had a um, uh, uh, study. Uh, it's a key informant interview uh, in support of our um, e-commerce roadmap, correct? And, and what we've done is to interview platforms. And I'm very pleased that it's a key informant interview by about 15 uh, major platforms. And they were all, they was, there was a major um, uh, recommendation to have a central agency that will kind of like be an orchestrator. So this is, um, this is really something, the unified uh, framework that we're saying that there should be really, um, it should be clear no, among, um, among um, government agencies. Na meron tayong tatakbuhan, a focal. But we're saying that there are certain laws already that are there and we don't intend to, to, um, to, uh, to, put, uh, as, to put those uh, laws aside. And there's this famous term that I all, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I know I am uh, in, a, in a virtual audience, maybe full of lawyers, but I saw their uh, term that uh, the e-commerce bureau or DTI will be ancillary uh, no, no, to, to the... So we are mindful that all the existing laws that are there should remain. Okay. Now, for the interest of the consumer, now it provides effective remedies. Um, 
DTI is empowered with regulatory powers uh, with the authority to take down websites. I attended a recent uh, seminar by the UK uh, intellectual property, and uh, it does say that there is really a need for an or uh, for a very clear uh, policy for the takedown. Uh, and uh, and uh, this will this particular law, uh, this bill, when enacted into law, will definitely make that uh, very clear. We we would like to um, we'd also like to say that of course while these are the regulations part, the DTI is also um, uh, one of the one of the measures or the tools that will protect the interest of the consumer is through a trust mark. So we, we are of the belief that, you know, you have a website and you see a, a trust mark there, an e-commerce Philippine trust mark, then you, then you can see that it's a, it's a trusted website. And that's something that, that this bill also provides for. Now, uh, for balancing interests of uh, entrepreneurs, consumers, and, uh, and uh, government, so uh, of course the, the creation of the, the Bureau is something that... Uh, that is quite evident in the bill, um, and then it also uh, makes it clear about the the the, the regulatory and the, the regulators and the framework. No? So um, we 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 believe that uh, when this law, when this bill was crafted, and in the conversations in the technical working groups, that uh, you know we have experiences that uh, has um, has. Uh, been the the result of all of the the um, uh, principles behind it. No? so we are we would like to see us as a maybe a, a, a model. No? Uh, we will be trailblazing because what this bill is for is for Filipinos, um, for the, for the Philippines. No? So uh, that that would that is something that we'd like to um, to believe. So let me we have. Uh, I won't go in the, the provisions, uh, but uh, why do we support? There are actually 10 reasons. Number one would be the Bureau. I will tell you more about that. Um, it encourages business registration, um, it, uh, especially making available online registration. So a lot of people are saying, this is an online business, but I have to go to the municipio. Uh, so we want to fix that. Uh, again, I would like to see uh, maybe some provisions for incentives. Um, it provides clear obligations for e-commerce platforms. Um, it is written in the proposed bill what the platforms should require. There is um, an alignment with ASEAN on the code of conduct uh, of what uh, how a merchant should should um, abide with the with the guidelines and the principles for e-commerce to protect consumers. Number six, there is an online dispute resolution platform uh, that. Uh, that will be the single point of entry for consumers. So we are also, uh, DTI is very much supportive and in fact is, plans to put this into action quite, quite soon. We would like to see an industry-led trust mark. Uh, the law in the, in the Senate bill, it says it's government, but we, we made our position uh, quite clear in the lower house that we would prefer that this be an industry-led uh, trust mark. The private sector is much more agile than government. Uh, and of course, they know the industry more more than we do, and uh, that's something that uh, hopefully can can also be adopted in the Senate version. Again, I I, uh, I we fully support the law because it will provide DTI with some power. So it you know it would be easy to uh, it will make it it will make life easier for our consumer protection arm to run after the violators. It clarifies the jurisdiction. Uh, again, this is something that uh, was uh, taken up. Uh, uh, before um, myself, uh, in the previous uh, speakers, that that there are already laws that are um, that shall remain and they shall continue to exercise those power. We support the passage of the Internet Transactions Act, particularly on its coverage. We, in fact, suggested because this is in line with the Google. If you are all familiar with the Google Temasek study, it identifies five categories, which is consistent with the law. Although it says here Internet retail in the Google study, it says actually e-commerce referring to goods um, and services. But uh, we called it Internet retail. That's for goods and services, online travel which we know is mostly the Department of Tourism plus maybe the Civil Aeronautics Board. Uh, online media refers to uh, maybe um, Netflix, uh, even gaming, uh, um, advertising, ride hailing, including food delivery, and digital financial services. Again, I keep on saying that the, the Banco Central um, is still going to be the regulator for that, but uh, this will be something that the e-commerce under the Internet Transactions Act and the e-commerce where there is a strong relationship with these uh, regulators. So let me just uh, very quickly our, our um, most important provision that we think uh, on why 
we encourage all of you here in the audience today to support the Internet Transactions Bill. There is this creation of an e-commerce bureau. Um, we always say here, it says to attain the objectives of the Act. Please do remember that uh, one of the major provisions here really is to promote the the, the roadmap. Now, there is a roadmap that I started earlier on. There are strategies in the roadmap that has to be pursued and implemented and coordinated. And we need an e-commerce bureau to make sure that that really is uh, going on uh, and that people are working the way they should. Um, we would we would like to build trust between consumers and sellers. So if there's any gap in the regulation, that's where the e-commerce uh, bureau will uh, will come in. Of course, we would we propose and we no, we support the fact that this bureau shall be under the Department of Trade and Industry. You can see that uh, you can see this is a proposal that we lifted uh, from um, uh, like a position because um, in the in, in the bill we suggest that maybe there there be some subpoena powers to empower the bureau director to issue summons. Um, there be provisions on rulemaking rule so that there will be authority to promulgate rules. Um, uh, of the bureau, and more, more importantly, and the most important part, it's really to the creation of a registry for online business. Uh, just this afternoon in the Senate hearing, that was really the key. Um, DTI cannot. It's, there's been difficulty in DTI if you have a problem, uh, you're victimized by some online seller in like uh, in like an uh, like social marketplace. It's very difficult to run after them if you don't know who they are uh, because they're not registered here. So, but. What we'd like to see is for the e-commerce bureau to to develop and maintain that registry of database, uh, that uh, registry of online businesses. Um, we there was um, we we have a slight difference in opinion as to what the animal will look like. We don't want this to be a big a, a big uh, bureaucracy like a bureau of customs or a bureau of internal revenue where it's headed by a commissioner. We just want to follow uh, the the organization in the Department of Trade where it's headed by a director and maybe some uh, assistant directors, which I think is really the value. It's really in the in the implementation and uh, and how the people in the DTI and the office will will pursue the mandate. Okay, um, the creation in the e-commerce bureau, there is a special section for that, which is the creation of the e-commerce bureau. If we are now preparing ourselves in the eventuality, we'd like it to be a um, a uh, much better um, bureau than where we are. Uh, we are a rickety bureau now. We are an e-commerce office. We thank the Department of Budget and Management for for approving our um, our request. So we are a we are an office composed of eleven people. So if you see the bill and the expectations from the bill, I don't think the eleven people will suffice. So uh, the bill allows for an organization which I presented earlier on. Uh, if you just a little bit of a background, um, Attorney JJ mentioned uh, his involvement in the e-commerce act. There is a section in the e-commerce act which has that the authority of the DPI and participating entities. Well, there is a provision we realize now after uh, 20 years um, of um, of the of the act that there is really a need to be clarif some clarity as to who uh, is going to be responsible in promoting e-commerce. Um, we there is a mandate to this uh, supervise the promotion, prom promote rules and regulation, uh, issue uh, quality standards. So if you look at each of these, there are different offices in the DTI who will do each one of those, um, and uh, it's quite difficult. So with an e-commerce office like uh, that, the, the one that I am leading right now, it's sort of a, a kind of like uh, like a uh, an orchestra that, that that directs and coordinates even within the Department of Trade. By the way, uh, I mentioned earlier in the in the beginning of the slide that uh, we are monitoring the Philippine e-commerce roadmap. There are 53 actionable items, and number 52 is the establishment and office dedicated to e-commerce. This is done. So uh, this is why we are here, and uh, uh, this is one of the things that we pursued immediately, as I mentioned to. Uh, to attorney JJ, uh, we went, worked on the roadmap and this is what we got. Um, you can see very, very recently where uh, I was appointed uh, responsible for the e-commerce office in 2019 and then later on as, a, as Assistant Secretary for Digital Philippines. This is who we are in, uh, now. Uh, I won't get into that, but uh, it's a rag rickety and small team of 11 people. 
Uh, very quickly, what do we do? Uh, we are focused on three major items. Uh, these 11 people that we coordinate, our, we always say we, we are e-commerce, right? Uh, while we are 11 people, when we do e-commerce, I'm actually talking of the Department of Trade and Industry because it is uh, incumbent upon the e-commerce office to really work closely together with other members of the team. So we are promoting e-commerce policies and regulations. Um, we want part of the uh, a great... Um, uh, mandate is really the, the digitalization of micro small medium enterprises so we have here the the, um, the smes um and then uh, on advocacy and promotion uh that's part of the that's part of uh, what we need to do we have to promote um e-commerce um and uh, this thing that when we speak out that's part of our advocacy and promotion campaign um, so on policy and regulation i mentioned that we are into the roadmap exercise uh, we are continuously working on the 53 actionable items in the uh, PECR of 2016 to 2020, but we are now working on the 2020 to 2022 roadmap. At the same time, as part of a bigger aspect and the more important one is really the Internet Transactions Act, which we hope, which we hope to be enacted into law during the president's time. The next aspect of what we do is uh, capacity building or the, dig the digitization of SMEs. We are in all of these. Um, we, we, um, we are very uh, grateful for Google. Uh, we are coordinating. We have a program with Google, with Facebook, um, and, and, and ma many of the platforms in, the, in helping our SMEs on board. We are working with the Banco Central to digitize merchant payments because uh, uh, what we want to see is uh, cashless transactions for, for merchants. We are also now with the value of, um, of contactless, even we are spearheading our negotiation center online. Uh, we have a brick and mortar of over 1,100 uh, negotiation center, but, uh, but the importance of going online is something that we are uh, prioritizing. You must have seen our reboot program and our control-based reboot seminar. So if you or any member of your family who'd like to go into online selling, please do visit our site because you have a lot of uh, resources there uh, to improve your business. Reboot, is, um, reboot program is a program that we initiated immediately after uh, when we were all under quarantine. Uh, the Secretary of Trade, Secretary Ramon Lopez, said to us, uh, we should uh, do something while everyone is in quarantine. We need to help our um, SMEs who are in brick and mortar to transform into an online uh, business. And uh, this, we did everything. We, we called up the telco so that they can provide free internet uh, service for those who would subscribe um, uh, and you are a small business. Many would like to have on a website uh, and uh, we realized that Google can do that for you. Union Bank can do that for you. And uh, we, we realized that uh, putting the information across is something that is valuable. We also have a financing program with our SB Corporation. A lot of people are interested about how to go to onboarding to Lazada, Zalora, Shopee, Shopinas. And uh, we practically uh, ask them to uh, ask our enablers to explain so that wala na po yung mga fake news, fake news, uh, no less. We wanted to demystify. Mahal dyan, mahal dyan, mahal dyan. We wanted to demystify all of that. And uh, we're, very, we're very glad that uh, a lot we have had good reviews relative to all of this um, um, uh, webinars that uh, of course the online payment uh, we are again working with the likes of Paymaya, Gcash to promote online payment and uh, the most important aspect of it all is the control biz reboot now which is a web an online conference until now na po, no? uh, we have done that and uh, as I said uh, we invite all of you who have not seen it to just go to our Facebook page and you can see that these are all the name. I have to take this opportunity to thank everyone, yeah, the enabling partners. You can see these are all familiar logos to you, but they we could not have done it without uh, a very strong and uh, robust uh, e-commerce ecosystem. Um, we're very happy, you know. Now we're having these webinars. Uh, in the past, I uh, we had the humble. Uh, uh, humble target. I said, happy na ako sa 300. Oh my gosh, when we realized that we do Zoom, uh, we've reached over 12,000 all in all. And then this is even fantastic. When you put it on Facebook Live, uh, see this, uh, we have views of about close to half a million and Facebook has, um, has an indicator of success, which is reach. So we're looking at uh, reaching now more, more hopefully uh, reach a million 
no, uh, in terms of reach. These are the number of people who continuously uh, support and watch all of the webinars that we have with very interesting topics. Um, digitization, we have a trabajo negocio skills pathway. This is, again, the role of the e-commerce office that we have right now. And these are all ongoing, by the way. Um, if you'd like to be part of all of this, just uh, email us. We have a skills pathway, and it's called trabajo negocio. Trabajo, or the control piece that I've mentioned about, you know, how to start your business, how to be a successful digital marketing, um, benta, bentang benta yung mga e-fulfillment, onboarding, yan, mga benta po yan. Uh, a lot of people People would want that, but we are in, but we are introducing, and this is an announcement uh, today, Attorney JJ. Uh, we are now going to launch our pet project, Pet Pivot Embrace Technology. That's what our new uh, project on skills, and this is an employment skill. You know, a lot of people have been uh, uh, left uh, unemployed because of COVID, and we'd like to maybe you know if you want to find alternative careers, uh, we can see that e-commerce. Um, um, in e-commerce companies are actually um, uh, expanding and they need people so if you are interested uh, then uh, do do register with us because we are coming out with a certification program to really upskill because we cannot have a successful e-commerce without um, without human capital that is uh, that has the digital skills necessary for um, for e-commerce Okay, these are some of it. I won't go into the detail, but just to let you know that these are some, even search engine optimization, digital marketing, these are everything, data analytics and all of that. Uh, this is the uh, pet project, as I said, uh, even e-commerce but for senior high school students, the unemployed, and then even the owners, uh, they want a certification program. Uh, so in terms of advocacy and promotion, uh, we, of course, this is e-commerce and uh, what better way than to um, use our social media so we are in facebook in youtube and we are now really getting into our um, websites now we see the value of having a robust website what are the key messages number one we want to build trust this is what government particularly dti is promoting we build trust in e-commerce so that more and more people will buy online and more and more people will sell online instead of we have the highest uh, number of uh, we have more mobile phones than we have population. We spend the most number in the internet at 10 hours, but we don't use it for productivity. We use it for chatting, for watching, for using at ways. What we want is really to promote online selling and online buying. Basta e-commerce madali. Uh, we always now say that. If in English we say it's fast, uh, madali at easy, pwede din po. But kami ho sa gobyerno, madali, market access, digitalization, and logistics integration. We always remember because those are our are, 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 um, priority. Uh, we promote market access. We have more, um, more, more um, customers for our, whether cross-border or domestic. Digitalization of SMEs, I've spent uh, explaining that. And logistics integration, we are also responsible uh, for logistics. We want to reduce logistics costs, much as, as we want to also to make it more efficient. The framework of the e-commerce Philippines 2022 is security, stability, and structure because this will result into sales. We are promoting e-commerce. We are telling our people we should adapt. Or otherwise we perish and we're saying that e-commerce is really not just selling but you know we always say uh, we always use the analogy of an ant nakatungtong naka yung ant sa jet mabilis siya diba parang ganun yung sinasabi natin you all need is network uh, you, you, why don't you focus more on your product uh, your marketing of your product then you let the others take, take uh, help you Maybe on board, diba? If you on board a platform, you don't, you don't need too much help because they can do the marketing for you. So it is about building and using networks through technology and internet. So you'll be surprised that as how many entrepreneurs would still not see the value of that, but that's what we are looking at. And of course, the number five in the, e, the, the key message is we are here. The Department of Trade and Industry to the e-commerce office is here. We are at your service. So all you need to do is to contact us through any
any of our um, uh, social media sites, e-commerce at dpi.gov.ph if you want the website. Um, also, the e-commerce at, e at dpi.gov.ph for the email. And also, please go and visit us at YouTube. And uh, if you want my email, add maryjeanpacheco at dpi.gov.ph. Thank you, Attorney JJ. And I hope I did not exceed my 20 minutes. Ay, nako, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's perfect. Actually, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, no, uh, sabi ko nga, I, I think I, uh, I might have, if I raised the expectation at the introduction, I think uh, you demonstrated it in your presentation. <laughs> thank uh, you. There's a lot of things that, that you guys are doing. Uh, can I ask uh, Lars and Oli to, uh, to, to join in and then we'll... Uh, I'll put you guys on gallery view for a moment, but I'll take I'll take this time to thank everyone who's here. I, I took note of uh, I asked you where you're watching from, and I I, I try to organize it north to north to south, and uh, I'm not uh, I'm not my uh, what's the word, my geography is not very good. But okay, so uh, Batak Ilocos North. Okay, we've got somebody from uh, Batak. See, uh, Attorney Lars actually coming in from Tabuk. Uh, um, and then there's somebody from Isabela, we got somebody from Baguio, La Union, Nueva Ecija, Subic, Quezon City, Pasig City, uh, Makati, Taguig, Manila, Merville Paranaque, Paranaque, Montenlupa, uh, Dasmariñas, Cavite, Carmona, Cavite, Nay, Cavite, Binyan, Laguna, Legaspi, Albay, meron from, ano, ha, from LA, uh, <laughs> um, Gaspel Bay, Sorsogon, Daet, Camerines Norte, Bacolod, Bohol, and even from Davao. So, uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, we have a nationwide, you know, we have Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao represented. Represented, we also actually have uh, one viewer from Doha, Qatar, and one viewer from Dubai. So it's interesting. That's the nice thing about uh, these webinars. We're really able to uh, to uh, get a lot more people and uh, uh, get content uh, out there. Uh, and there's just some people, tech, some, some people from Antipolo, Cagayan de Oro City, welcome. And, and I, I uh, so how do you spell uh, Debes and Scott Masbate? I know you've uh, logged in before. Th welcome, uh, and uh, we're happy to have you. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you uh, to all our speakers for for speaking. There's so there were so many questions. There's um there was actually a, a comment made, uh, and I, I'd like to bring it to your attention. And and this is more to do with um, maybe less about. Um, you know, it's a philosophical question because here it is, we've got this law. Uh, and the question is that maybe if we regulate, it might not be better. And an example niya is that Uber and Grab were running smoothly without government intervention. And then LTFRB stepped in and then it, it, uh, it, it uh, screwed it up. And uh, I think there, there's some concern whether the type of regulation that we can expect from ITA might do that, just that. You know, it might prevent uh, innovators from uh, from innovating. Would you, would you have any comment about that? Yep. Uh, well, it's, uh, of course, an age-old philosophic debate. And, of course, uh, one of the important things is once new regulations are in place, that there is enough flexibility to see how effective they are and to continuously monitor how effective the regulations are and to be able to adjust in case that regulations are proving ineffective. And one way that uh, to ensure that is to give enough flexibility to the administrative agency that is administering it. Uh, but it's, all, it's, it's an age-old philosophic debate. And uh, it's interesting that the example was Grab and Uber because uh, for one, while many consumers were satisfied with the, because especially in, um, in comparison with the competition given by taxis, um, there still were issues about the price, about the price range. The fact that the seeming dominance of those players uh, allowed them to um, to undertake certain actions with that escape the scope of regulation. And I think that that's even a debate in competition law. Uh, the trend towards um, as long as consumers are enjoying services and the prices are low, is that already enough reason for the government to abdicate a regulatory responsibility when it comes to competition? So um, it's an age-old debate, but I think flexibility would be the key. I think the next question, the question, next question is for Asek, Asek Jean. Um, so um, 
and and it it actually this is a concern raised in many questions eh, about what uh, what uh, what can the Philippine government do really to uh, to regulate these uh, offshore platforms? But here's the specific question. Um, aside from express jurisdiction and subpoena powers, what tools and resources does DTI need to enforce penalties and punish violators, given that violators can hide behind the anonymity of the internet? Anong, uh, uh, what thoughts do you have, Asikin? Mm -hmm. So that's difficult, no? I mean, the question itself is difficult, <laughs> um, and and I would always say this is the reason why we do have we we need certain laws, no? Um, because really, it's exactly it's exactly what's happening, and uh, and uh, why we need to have some regulations. I you know, I have to tell you something. Um, I am a victim in Facebook. So, because you don't know who they are, and then it ended up with a with a um, courier now uh, um, uh, get, um, absorbing, no, absorbing the the um, the um, the cost, no, just because para ano na lang para maging clear. But is it is it really that way? So the question is, what tools or resources does DTI need, no? So this bill, uh, this is why we need the bill because. Simple lang eh, the mere fact that we need to know who they are and where they are and allowing us, no? If you know that we cannot, if we, we ask the platform now, can you give me the address of this particular person? We, you know, we can't do that. Um, we tell, can, you, can you give us a list of those? We cannot get that. So we need, we need something, a regulation that will allow a government agency like ourselves. So that when, I, when we ask you, a platform, whoever you are, if we ask you, we need you, uh, give us the name, then you give us because we're government. So, so um, um, I mean, the, the, the important um, power of information alone, I think that's one of the greater tools. And then we run after them. And then if the person is outside, no, uh, that's why it, it has, they're required to register. Because in other countries, they should be required, right? So if they are required in that other country, in the other countries, and we now become cross-border, again, that's also a DTI matter. So we do have a lot of um, um, avenues in the arsenal of government, no? Um, and we intend, but we need to be stronger here in, in the country. I hope I answered uh, yeah. that question. That's right, Asik. Actually, uh, um, uh, it really, I think the one of the reasons why the authority is being explored, no? the, the power to be given to the DTI is because uh, it can get frustrating uh, for the DTI to receive. I, I was actually surprised at your numbers, 13,000 uh, 13, uh, complaints. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, and it's going to go up. And if the DTI cannot, cannot locate these, uh, these sellers because they're anonymous or they're behind platforms, uh, then there has to be some way for for the DTI to to render them or hold them accountable. So I think that's that's really uh, that's one of the you know uh, the flip side also if if I may uh, just add to that is also and I think this has been expressed um, by uh, the sponsor of the bill, uh, Congressman Gachalian. Uh, he is concerned about uh, leveling the playing field. That, you know, if I'm a Filipino entrepreneur engaging in e-commerce, I have to comply with local regulations. So if you're a foreign entity accessing the same market, meaning selling to Filipinos, dapat we should pay the same taxes, subject ourselves to same licensing uh, obligations. Um, now, let's, uh, uh, let me see. Um, now, I, I guess, I don't know if uh, Attorney Lars can answer this. There's some questions about micro businesses so i think you answered this question a bit but what sort of what sort of uh, regulations do you see micro businesses uh, uh, needing to comply with under the ita they're small fb based mga drop i think they're called drop shippers are they called drop shippers yeah so uh, actually the way that the bill is drafted now there's no there's really no exemption for online sellers but as mentioned by uh, the by asec there's a provision in the Senate version granting uh, MSMEs certain uh, leeways in terms of taxation. However, in terms of compliance, all entities engaged in e-commerce as described by the law, and that would cover like Instagram sellers, etc., would have to be compliant. Right. Actually, uh, there was a proposal made earlier today 
uh, by one senator, they're introducing a uh, clause that says that if sales, annual sales are below a certain threshold, then uh, I think they want to exempt them from uh, many of the uh, registration. Ano? Kasi kung hindi naman significant yung uh, value. But I think that the Congress has to fine-tune fine -tune that. Uh, ano. um, let me see. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll throw the next one uh, to Oli. Oli, all right. So will this mean, will this law mean goodbye to Netflix? Uh, because Netflix is uh, mass media. If it is deemed doing business in the Philippines uh, on the basis of purposefully availing of the Philippine market, uh, will it be disqualified on the basis of nationality? What do you think? And Spotify as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's of course a very interesting question. And just for those who may not be familiar, that is an issue because the Constitution has this provision about um, uh, national, requiring 100% uh, Filipino nationality for uh, mass media activities. Of course, one argument that can be made is that um, if Netflix uh, Netflix is a streaming platform, then it's uh, um, not producing content, then maybe it's not mass media. Although that's not a, I mean, you know, that may, would be a fairly controversial argument. Uh, I think that you know this, it, this is going to be a you know it, it's sort of a elephant in the room question, but I think that uh, another potential avenue there is to how do we exactly interpret that constitutional provision, and if, for example, a you know a constitutional right such as freedom of expression can be used to balance or to um, help you know, to interpret the constitutional provision in such a way that would be less restrictive towards expression or speech, and that would be something that would accommodate or that could possibly accommodate the Netflix. But it's, of course, um, but I think that it's also worth pointing out that the bill itself would not ban Netflix. Um, the bill itself would not ban Netflix, and the bill itself would not also, for example, uh, that issue that was raised a few weeks ago about MTRCB, exercising jurisdiction over Netflix, uh, that's not going to happen with this bill. Um, all it does is to establish a legal framework that uh, as long as one is availing of Philippine consumers, uh, then they are not exempt from the regulatory jurisdiction of the Philippine government. And actually that principle um, could already have been explicitly recognized even before this bill was um, was was drafted, so it's not in it's not exactly a novel idea or a novel provision. All right, um, let me see. There's a question here, and and this relates to uh, the small merchants, uh, and uh, you know, and, and this reminds me of uh, something that was mentioned in one of the the hearings, no? uh, where uh, one of the uh, the uh, major platforms was saying. That we don't, that the law is not necessary because we are already, I think there, and, and it was a valid point. Huh? They were already solving a lot of the problems. I think they mentioned they only had less than one tenth of one percent uh, of complaints, which they resolved. And then, um, and then for small merchants, smaller merchants, they formed a cooperative uh, where uh, if you're a small, small, small merchant, you don't have receipts. They make you part of the cooperative, so the seller will be the cooperative. So I guess the, what they're saying there is um, the market naman can uh, solve these problems. Uh, do you think that's... Uh, that's uh, uh, what, what are your comments about that? Is it ASIC Gene, do you have any comments about that, that point yeah. of view? Again, it, um, ako kasi it's like uh, being the father of the family, you know, I mean, that, uh, that uh, government at a certain point uh, always has... Uh, um, uh, responsibility, you know, um, for 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 its citizens. So, so as um, there are as long as there are crimes committed, <laughs> diba? But uh, in the case of DTI, we, as you can also hear in the hearing, kanina, we recognize as much as possible, no, the private sector can do it, no, if they can handle it. We're we're encouraging, uh, we're encouraging, but. We in government must make sure that they they abide by a certain code or standard. Um, if it's if it if you if you are selling 
um, fake items in your platform, that is a violation of the intellectual property laws of the land. So that's parang that you you should you should to be accountable. So mga ganon that uh, that uh, it's a it's a balancing act, um, and and that's that's why uh, you know the the role of legislators is or you know it's difficult because you really have to <laughs> to uh, to balance things. Yes, and to study uh, the intervention. Mm-hmm. I think I think uh, as you raised a good point about um, uh, the difficulty of regulating, and uh, I can tell you from the standpoint of uh, law enforcement. Uh, I think there were uh, you're familiar with uh, the concerns of law enforcement. It's difficult for them to engage in investigation, to run after wrongdoers if the platform is offshore because the, the evidence is also offshore. And then so now you have to deal with two legal systems and the mutual legal assistance treaty is sometimes not um, not effective. And somehow this law, if there's some local uh, localization of the of the platform, then it becomes easier now for law enforcement to get the uh, the information and protect protect our citizens. So you're right; it has to Congress, and actually this is really the the big, the very big question and the task of Congress is to balance, um, just have enough uh, regulation that makes sense that everyone can do their job, the government can do their job of protecting consumers, and that uh, well the business people can can uh, can also do their job of solving a lot of these problems and providing good services and innovating and harnessing all of that, all of that value for, for the growth of the, the economy. So I think we're, we're running out of time and, and I just like to ask our, some parting shots from our, uh, from our uh, guests. I'd like to uh, ask uh, Attorney Lars to, to give uh, you know, uh, her parting shots or parting words. Attorney Lars. Okay, uh, okay so parting words. Uh, actually, when it comes to, I understand that it, it's really difficult, even as lawyers, uh, to come up with a way or with a regulatory approach for innovative, uh, innovative business models. So various regulatory approaches have been proposed. So, for example, uh, some proponents would say it's better to just wait and see, and see where the technology goes, uh, and then. At the other end of the spectrum, naman, some say that you should legislate first, which of course we know would lead to a bunch of problems when, since you'll essentially be preempting the technology that you barely understand. Uh, but I think uh, at this point, there's, a, there's probably a general consensus among like, lawyers and even people in the industry that some level of regulation is crucial in order for these platforms like e-commerce players in the Philippines to properly grow. Uh, and I think we've reached that point since uh, the main problem really right now, I think that the law is trying to address is trust trust in e-commerce platforms and in digital platforms. And hopefully this law would uh, somehow address, address those concerns. But at the same time, it wouldn't lead to like burdensome uh, regulations that would actually stop or that would be, uh, that would be, that would act instead as hurdles for our internet, uh, internet economy. And uh, just as a last point, a lot of the points in the law, actually, a lot of the provisions are, as mentioned by the previous speakers, are not that new. You can uh, get all of these from our existing regulations. Like for example. Uh, the fact that foreigners, foreign retailers, or foreign e-commerce players have to register in the Philippines, uh, that's already a given. But I think uh, this law just sends out the message that at this point, government is really serious and would actually, is really serious in enforcing or going after, uh, going after these players. So, yeah, that's it for me. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Lars. Uh, Attorney uh, Oli? Uh, thank you uh, for yeah, th- th- thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so just a you know just building up on what Lars said and also from what I said earlier about flexibility, I think that this uh, Internet Transactions Act is a well calibrated piece in that it does recognize the need for a essential framework, but it is uh, and it does provide for the basic protections, especially in favor of consumers, 
but it also allows for enough flexibility. It allows for administrative expertise from an agency such as the e-commerce bureau, and it gives the e-commerce bureau a sufficient mandate as well as a sufficient structure in order to be able to have the flexibility to address regulatory issues as they emerge. And that's one of the problems with, um, with technology because technology moves so fast and the legislative process moves so slow. Uh, those, 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 those two trends rarely coincide or rarely catch up with each other. So having the flexibility of an administrative agency to be able to step in, to have a sufficient mandate to be able to craft rules in the interim, perhaps, uh, while Congress uh, deliberates on matters, I think that would be a step that would help build trust and confidence in e-commerce in general. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Attorney Oli. Last but not least, uh, <laughs> Jean. Thank you, Attorney JJ, for inviting us. But uh, to everyone, uh, our virtual audience, thank you also for listening. As you can see from my background here, it says trabajo, negocio, and consumer. You know? So it really is quite difficult. You can, say, you can see with the DTI what we are about. No? So uh, the, this particular bill, the Internet Transactions Act, really, uh, you know, we, we hope to have an e-commerce office that can continue to do all of these things that, that's behind my back to make it more efficient. But um, I'd like to actually invite everyone that, uh, you know, this is, uh, please be involved with, the, with, the, with policy making. Um, if you are in touch with uh, Attorney JJ here, who is uh, quite instrumental uh, in everything that we do here as we talk and discuss the Internet Transactions Act. Now's the time, no? Uh, we are not a closed, uh, I know it's something that we'd like uh, maga crowdsourcing if at all. So, uh, you know, there can't be a law that, you know, we cannot see everything. But at a certain point in time, you have to count on the wisdom of uh, the policymakers that they will do what is exactly right for the Filipinos in the Philippines, no? uh, whether we are here as the first or, uh, but I do know for a fact that people are watching. And I also know for a fact that other countries are also doing their own reviews of their specific regulations. So please do take part in the policy formulation of the internet transactions. All you need to do is to either get in touch with either the DPI or again to uh, Attorney JJ. So that's it. Let's all be part of this, um, this journey of uh, policy. And uh, we hope that it will be good for the country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to uh, close this uh, uh, session on, uh, of uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. Um, you know, uh, e-commerce more now than ever has become a sort of very central to our, uh, to our reality. Uh, and I think it's timely that we're having this discussion. I think we're very fortunate that we have um, some very serious uh, discussion that's happening. If you, if you could only see our senators and our congressmen asking questions and getting engaged, they are concerned as well. They want to do the right thing. They're trying to strike uh, a balance and they want to hear uh, as, many, you know, as many opinions as possible. So if you do want to get involved, please do. Uh, you can go through your local congressman as well. That's another venue for you to get for your voice to be heard. Um, now, um, I'll just uh, a quick uh, uh, lang, just uh, to push our next episode. Our episode next week, is, uh, next week is actually quite important. It's on the online sexual exploitation of children. And there's a lot of uh, internet uh, predators out there uh, that might be stalking uh, even people that you know. Uh, I know, you know, in a, in a household, people have a tendency to be isolated from each other. And therefore, our, our, our children you know, who are online on their tablets may become, may fall prey to these predators. And that will be the subject of our discussion uh, uh, next week. Uh, I think it's a very important, uh, very important uh, phenomenon that we've been seeing. It's, it's, uh, it's actually quite sad that, uh, that the Philippines is in the center of that. But there are some very thoughtful and very... Um, dedicated people who are uh, on this problem and uh, they will be our guests next week. So uh, on that note, uh, we'd like to uh, thank you again and uh, we'll see you next week uh, at um, uh, the next Digital Transformation Thursday. Thank you and uh, good evening. <laughs>